and welcome to Media 7. I'm Russell Brown. It's 40 years since a book called The Female Eunuch barged its way into the culture, and although its author, Jermaine Greer, placed herself outside the women's movement proper, she and her book shaped and changed perceptions of what feminism was. In this show, we'll look at what's changed and what hasn't in feminism and the media. But first, who is Jermaine Greer anyway? Forty years ago, a book was published that became a crucial text for the feminist movement. It was called The Female Eunuch and was written by Jermaine Greer, a 31-year-old Australian literature professor. The book is a response to Freud, who, argues Greer, desexualised women when he wrote that it was possible to maintain that libido is invariably and necessarily of a masculine nature, whether it occurs in men or women. In other words, sleeping around and getting kinky? That's totally a guy thing. According to Greer, it's this idea that's led to a society that conditions women all their lives to accept a passive sexual role. Hence the castration alluded to in the title of the book. I say that just as a bullet doesn't know what it's like to be a bull and doesn't know what he's missing, so women who live in... Uh, in the normal circumstances in our society, don't know what it's like to be really female and really human and really in control of all their potential. For Greer, this state of affairs devitalised women and deflected their energy into homemaking and raising children, all part of the pattern of capitalist society. What I was really interested in was energy, and energy and libido seem to me to be completely uh, coextensive. The, the two things go together, desire to put women in touch with the idea that they had the right to want things and to go and get them. The female eunuch made her an instant star. Her visit to New Zealand caused a stir when she was arrested for cussing like a sailor while delivering a speech. Tell me, what do you feel now about New Zealand justice? I think it works like it does in most places. The law is an ass anywhere. In fact, she's never been too far from controversy. She inexplicably agreed to be one of the housemates in Big Brother, which confused everyone, including, it appeared, herself. I didn't expect this level of squalor, either mental or actual. This was a mistake. That annoyed her admirers and incited her detractors, including Australian columnist Louis Naura, who wrote recently... As she's grown older, her writings have become increasingly daft. There's now a sense that she's impersonating even parodying herself, she's become a grotesque character called Jermaine Greer. Nonetheless, the book remains an essential part of the feminist movement. And the important thing is for feminists to survive, to find a way of life which permits them to have decent relationships with other women and with their children, and if they must, with men. Or does its legacy only extend as far as the current fad of vajazzling? A supposedly empowering practice where women adorn their lady gardens with crystals. It looks like a little disco ball down there, it's great. Discuss and come back to me with 300 words by Monday. Jose Barbosa there. Uh, with me now are former MP and an expert on the economics of gender equity, Marilyn Waring. New Artland producer and the founder of BFM's A Girl's Own Show, Gemma Gracewood and Sophia Blair, who is National Women's Rights Officer for NZUSA and is doing her thesis on, it says here, feminist stuff. <laughs> Welcome to you all. Now, Marilyn, you were there when Jermaine Greer visited. Uh, you were in the room when she spoke at Victoria. What was the atmosphere around that visit? Uh, it was electric. Um, there was somebody highly intelligent coming with a critical analysis to an institution that was full of patriarchy. And, uh, yeah, it was it, huge energy, huge passion, very challenging. So it was great to be there. Well, so would you also describe it as, as being glamorous at, at that time as well? Because it seems to me that she was really... She was reflecting what she'd written about in the book. She seemed to be quite a compelling character, didn't she? Well, she's about six foot two, you know, and she was a very good-looking woman. Um, so I don't think that had anything to do with it. Uh, the, the female eunuch was um, written for a general audience. It wasn't her doctoral thesis. Um, she subsequently wrote amazing uh, books like The Obstacle Race, where, again, she looked at the invisibility of women in, as artists. 
Uh, so it seemed to me that she was bringing into a patriarchal institution a voice that was silent and silenced. Um, when Counting for Nothing, for example, was first published, the first women who used that as an authority in their economics degrees for their doctorates um, at the University of Toronto, for example, were failed because I wasn't an expert. I mean, that was turned around on appeal, but that was the kind of environment that Greer came into. And we'd all had to read all these novels as secondary school students with particular uh, um, interpretations. And she was just challenging. She was challenging all over the place. She was challenging the philosophers that we were all supposed to take as gods. It was great. Do you think the it was fact what that, a university was supposed to be about. Do you think the fact, though, that <clears throat> the, the female eunuch wasn't, as you said, wasn't a thesis, it wasn't an academic book, do you think that that had a major... That was the reason for its impact? Because I, I picked it up as a teenager. Um, I thought it looked smutty, to be honest. But <clears throat> it made a major impression on me. And it was a really lively, visceral, vital book. Yeah, and, and extremely well written. Um, and, uh, but, but a little sort of dumbed down, frankly, uh, from what Greer's mind was capable of. But, you know, if you're a feminist who wanted to invade... Uh, you know, the universe as it was then and have people like you reading it, then obviously it had to appeal. And probably whoever was designing the cover had that in mind as well. Gemma, mm. um, we went for a generational span here. Um, what was the climate around feminist ideas for you at university? Did you feel part of a so-called third wave? Uh, yeah, so I went to university in 1990. I was, I was just a baby. I was 16. And yeah, third wave, the so-called third wave was definitely on its way in. And, um, and I think, uh, you know, I, there was over the course of the next sort of half decade an increase in zine publishing culture mm. amongst women, uh, an increase in, well, the Riot Girl movement blew up, you know, came Which out. Which were all we media had, phenomena, weren't they? Exactly. So, yeah. We had Kathleen Hanna, we had L7, we had um, music that hadn't been heard before on the you know, BFM playlist, that kind of thing. And so we, and we also had two really important books at that time, which were Susan Faludi's Backlash and, and Naomi Wolf's The Beauty Myth. Mm. So it was, a, it was definitely a time of a whole lot of new literature, you know, across the board coming out. So know. what you've listed all sounds to me like the ways you defined yourself as, as being different from the generation before. Would that be fair? I, I haven't defined myself as different from the generation before, personally. But I, yeah, well, if you but call I, but yourself no. as a third wave, yeah, then... Yeah, I guess I, I, I just define myself as a feminist, not as an any wave feminist. Um, yeah, it's just, it just is. It's what do you call yourself, yeah. Sophia? <laughs> Um, I'd say I was a feminist. Um, I, in terms of waves, I mean, I'm sort of part of the, the next generation, sort of, if you call it like that, after the third wave, and I don't think that generation has even worked out if it's part of the third wave generation or if it's a, you know, a new generation of, part, you know, moving on from that. So, I mean, at the moment, I think it's just seeing where things go and what are the sort of issues for women in the 21st century. Would you be unusual in your peer group uh, in happily defining yourself as a feminist? Oh, no, I wouldn't be unusual. I think most of the young women I know who I associate with on a political basis are, I would call themselves feminists, some would call themselves very radical feminists, some would sort of feminists, you know, that sort of just integrate into their daily lives, but they're not the type that go out and protest on the streets. Um, maybe, you know, my old high school friends, maybe not. Um, but, you know, when I sit down and talk with some of them and, you know, talk about the issues I'm working on and stuff like that, they all agree yeah. with the work that I'm doing. They all support the sort of work that I do and with uh, NZUSA and violence against women and, you know, tertiary education issues. So... So th th there's clearly the, there's life in it. Do you, do mm. you get annoyed when older feminists l l <laughs> lament? You know, I mean, because you do hear this, where are the young feminists? There aren't any. Yeah, and it's not that they don't exist. I think young women exist as feminists in quite different and quite radical different yeah. ways. Even the question is strange. It's mm. like there's a central committee and a little red yes. book and one way to do right. it. <laughs> yeah. It's like, hello? And the, yeah. Idea, yeah, the idea of recruitment and yeah, where do precisely. I sign up? Where do I sign <laughs> up? Yeah. So what you're saying is I'll do my feminism my own way. Well, it, it's... It, it's, it, you know, obviously, if it's about rights, you know, then it's not about one way to be a feminist. Mm. I've always thought it's a bit like building a mosaic. You know, I'm never going to understand what it's like to be behind a shador fighting for secular politics in Iraq. You know, but they're feminists, mm. right? I'm not going to understand how it is to be in the Solomon Islands and to 
the 92% of the women who were last pregnant get being beaten during pregnancy. You know, that's not my life experience. Mm -hmm. And I'm not also going to be Mei Chen worrying about whether or not we've got enough women on boards, you know, but they're all feminists. You know, and, and you know, I'm, I'm much more likely to sit here and say, why are we all park here? What's your problem? <laughs> <laughs> You know, um, have we moved? Yeah. Mm. Is anybody yeah. learning anything yet? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> did, did you consider yourself a political lesbian in the 70s? Because that was always a controversial term, wasn't it? Well, I don't know what on earth that is. I mean, as long as I'm <laughs> conscious, I'm going to be political, and I've always been gay. So, you know, um, it was always like you always read these columnists who were mm. talking, worrying about whether you were a trot or a Marxist <laughs> yeah. or a radical or something. But it was kind of not part of my universe, and it still isn't. Mm. Yeah, but it, weren't you the definition of a political lesbian? <laughs> well, I was all they had. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Those of them who right. thought they were didn't think I was one because I was in the National Party. Exactly. You know, which I hadn't got their, their strategy right. You know, if you're going to be there, you had to be where the power was, yes. you know, which was... Yeah. And none of them were any good. I mean, they're all patriarchal. What the hell? <laughs> was feminism inextricably tied to the left back then? No, of course not. And it's not inextricably tied to any male patriarchal ideology. <laughs> You well, know, we don't, we don't need that kind of stuff. We're, we're going to have a cup of tea. And <laughs> yeah, right. Just go for it. No, 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 it's, no it's great. I just want to listen to you for the next 20 minutes. Well, let's finish that point before we go to the break. It's, uh, it's, it's not, because it does tend to get lumped in with, with um, left-wing analyses and Marxism. Right. You, you'd know that from, from university, wouldn't you? Oh, yeah, I think I am, um, to some extent. I, and I can't say this completely, but I certainly think I have a bit of a reputation as being the sort of that Sophia Blair, you know, crazy feminist on campus, you know, part of the Labour Party, all that kind of stuff, you know. Well, that could be a contradiction you know. in terms of time. <laughs> <laughs> right, so I think there's, but I mean, I guess I feel as a feminist that I don't really give it. I don't really care about that, what they say, and the kind of point of being a feminist is that you, you know, you are staunch in what you believe in and willing to get out there and defend it. Well, we'll take a break now and um, return with a look at the way the women's mags used to be. Younger viewers may be surprised. <laughs>